supposed to be in here. We switched because I had a demonstration for Solaris that was going to be on that screen, and there wasn't a screen in the other room. But somebody owned the power adapter, so that was kind of a pointless switch. But we're going to stay here for this talk anyway. Um, pretty much, we are going to uh, go through the uh, hardening process of Solaris. Um, I had asked for about two hours and I got 50 minutes, so we're going to be kind of cruising to get everything done in time. Um, the old, and back to the wireless thing, for the rest of the day, the breakout area is going to be in Athena, and wireless is going to be in here. Um, what I want to do this morning is go through pretty much a step-by-step -step process of how to lock down and harden a Solaris install. Uh, basically, what the best practice of actually hardening a box before you put it on the network is what I'm looking at. However, because I live in the real world and I know that a lot of times these boxes are already on your networks, most of the concepts that we're going to talk about you can do to a live box. Uh, anytime that it's going to be something that's dangerous to a live box or to an operational box, I, I'm going to go ahead and point that out to you so that you uh, know to be careful before you try it. Um, what we're going to cover this morning are basically uh, installation, uh, what we can do with the open boot process, uh, screen auto lock for the GUI, uh, disabling services, setting up disk quotas, uh, access control lists, set UID, set GID files, which Solaris by default has a ton of uh, permissions and setting them correctly. Setting up, uh, verifying the paths are correct. Uh, aliases, um, system identification, groups, accounts, and passwords, logging, cron at jobs, and also the if you must use stuff that I would recommend that you turn off immediately before you even think about looking at your box. But if you got to use it for some operational requirement, what we can do there. Uh, the NDDs. Uh, and some miscellaneous stuff, and finally, the border. What I'm not going to cover today are DNS and BIND, uh, NIS and NIS Plus, NFS, uh, and service-specific or third-party software like Apache or anything like that, because any one of those we could talk for two hours on by themselves. Uh, first off, installation. Load from an official CD. Don't get some burned CD that somebody has said, hey man, this is a great Solaris 8 version, go with it. Uh, also, make sure that you set up your partitions large enough to accommodate patches. I've found that one of the biggest problems I run into is that people download the patch cluster, but they haven't actually set up a partition big enough to put the patches on the machine, and they end up having to either rebuild or skip the patch. Uh, don't load the entire distribution, which is actually what I'm covering. I'm covering today from a full, uh, an idiot install, in other words. If you just come in and say everything plus OEM, that's how we're looking at it. Don't do that. Just install the packages that you need um, and apply the appropriate patches. There is the link for the patches and uh, the presentation's on your CD and all the links are on there, so if you don't have them, you can just uh, copy paste them out of there. Uh, also, maintain two current backups. Try, if you have the uh, resources, keep one on site and keep one off site. Open boot. Um, open boot is fun because I like to make things difficult with open boot. Um, First of all, I suggest that you uh, set the security level to full instead of command. However, at a minimum, it needs to be set to command. To do that, from the root prompt, E prompt security mode equals command. Very difficult. From the open boot prompt, set M security mode command. Also very easy. For full, pretty much the same thing, except you go with full instead of command. Open boot password. From the, you should always set the open boot password. That way when somebody comes by and reboots your machine because uh, some idiot didn't lock the screen, they cannot, uh, they have to know an additional password before they can even begin to start playing around with your system. To do that, from the uh, root prompt, EEPROM, security password, it'll prompt you and you put your password in. 
from the Open Group prompt password. Also set an Open Group banner. Just set the environment variable for the OEM banner to true, and then this system property of or unauthorized access or whatever you want to put in there. Make sure that you've got something, it's, it's an extra little uh, no trespassing sign that you can put on the machine. If you, the GUI really should be in the if you must use section because mainly what I'm talking about today are servers and the fact of the matter is there is no reason that you need to have a GUI enabled on your server. If for some reason you have some idiot manager that decides that you need to have the GUI on there so that you can come look at pretty output or whatever, then make sure that you have the auto lock enabled. For CDE, very easy to do. Um, right click on the desktop, choose desktop controls, choose the uh, screen style manager and click the on button and then make sure to scroll the screen wherever you want it to be set. I like to do it at one minute, um, that way if I walk away for any reason it would immediately pretty much go to uh, screen lock. However, most people seem to like five or ten minutes a little bit better. It's a little bit more realistic in case you turn around to pick up a piece of paper. For open windows, properties, miscellaneous, and set the screen saver to auto and fill in the number of minutes that you want to actually have it um, turn on the auto lock. Services. I want Before I get started on services, one thing. Disable all unneeded services. When I, I go out and do assessments pretty much uh, at least one a week, and one of the biggest problems that I have, both from an assessment standpoint and from an uh, incident response standpoint, is somebody has got owned because they have their box sitting there with Telnet running and FTP running or SNMP, um, any number of services. Solera starts about a 900,000 by default. So you want to make sure to actually disable, only have the services that you're running. If it's an SSH server, make sure and have it running only SSH and nothing else. If it's Apache, just web and whatever method you're going to use to actually access the box remotely, SSH being the, the best choice there. I'm going to switch real quick to um, what I did was I did an uh, ISS scan. Oops. I did an ISS scan of a default Solaris install with OEM. That is the what ISS picks up. As you can see, there are a ton of highs, ton of mediums, and a ton of lows. But I also did was at the end of this, after we've gone, I went through the whole process, and I did another scan to show you what the difference is, and we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. But as you can see, this is what most people have sitting on their network. Most people just put a default install. If it works, they're good. So they think. Unfortunately, they don't realize the admin D is started, well, S admin D is started by default. They don't realize that SNMP daemon is running and the NFS server is running. Ah. Let me catch myself back up for that suck with PowerPoint. Okay, to disable unneeded services, first off, inedd.com. That is where you're going to have about 30 unneeded services that are uh, enabled by default. Telnet's in there, FTP is in there. Um, what else? Ad SAdmin D is in there. Tooltalk database server is in there. If you're not using them, disable them. If you are using any of, well, if you're using any of those, try and figure out why and see if you can't get rid of them. Uh, the way to do that is just quite simply to comment out, comment out the lines that aren't needed. 
also check your rc2.d and rc3.d directories. They have the uh, startup scripts in there. You're going to want to move the uh, file to a different name just do it and stop the, system, the service if it's already running. Um, I usually just use a lowercase letter, then when it boots up it won't get it. Other people put dots in front of them and do all kinds of things, but whatever method you want to use is fine, just as long as it has changed the name from a capital S with the uh, number and the, and the service. One thing that I like to let people know is um, the GUI interface. Checkpoint 501, people love the stupid GUI on that thing. Um, so what I've, what I've been able to find out is if you've got some manager that wants you to run a GUI so he can come and look at the pretty firewall rules, what you can do is disable the GUI for having it running by simply killing RPC. If you have RPC dead, the GUI will not work. Then all you have to do if you want to enable the GUI is restart uh, RPC manually, just a S71 RPC start, and then uh, start the GUI up and you can do whatever you need to do and then disable it when you're done. Make sure to disable send mail. It is started by default. If it's not a mail server you want to get rid of it, it opens up a ton of problems for you. To do that, that is in rc2.d and it's the S88 script. Uh, if it is a mail server, configure it to prevent message source routing by commenting out the, ne the next few lines in the uh, sendmail.cf. I'm not going to read those, but you can look at them and they are on the CD. Uh, expand and verify are started by default. What you want to do with those is uh, add the following two lines to sendmail.cf. Op no expand, op, op no verify. That will kill those for you. Uh, install and configure secure shell on the CD uh, in the directory. I actually put the uh, I pulled the HTML file for how to install OpenSSH on the CD so that you can read through it. It's got it's got pretty good directions on what files you need. I actually wanted to put uh, several other things, including OpenSSH and um, the recommended zip files on there. But when I got done with all the stuff I wanted to put on the CD, I think I had a CD by myself, so they told me to dial it back a bit. User quotas. Does anybody have any idea why you would want user quotas? Mainly? Go ahead. I'm going to assume you're right because I can't hear you, but if he said because um, you don't want your users to have, users are generally running their own scripts, they've got all kinds of things that are running in their home directories, you don't want them to get, have something get away from them and run away and take up all of your disk space. If you have a quota there, it will stop that from happening. And for me, user quotas is actually pretty easy. The uh, first thing you do is you edit the VFS, VF, uh, VFS tab um, and add the uh, mount option for quota, which is just quota at the very end. There's a dash there by default, replace it with quota. Uh, create a file called quotas in the uh, root directory of the file system. And for what we're doing here, we're going to take a look at export home. Touch export home quotas. Then you're going to need to set up a prototype quota entry, and to do that you use Ed Quota, Ed Quota Proto User, whatever the user that you want to be there. And you edit the number of blocks, uh, hard and soft blocks and inodes. What that does is that tells you how big of a uh, disk space they're allowed to have, and also how many uh, files they are allowed to have. The inodes are the, are the number of files. So the, in, in our example here, they're getting um, five megabytes of space, and they are getting up to a thousand, um, a thousand uh, files in their home directory. Uh, that, will when they, that will be when they get a warning. That's the soft limit. The hard limit is when it will actually cut them off. They will not be able to log back in uh, until they get that fixed. Oh, I'm sorry, they will be able to log back in. They will not be able to create any new files or add any new uh, space to the disk. Uh, then what you need to do is replicate that across the board for all the users. 
So if you have 10 users in there, A quoted minus P, then your proto user, and then just list out the names of the users that you want to set that quota up for. Next thing you do is activate them with cord on, which is the cord on and the file system that you want the quotas to be enabled on. Uh, quota check command is used next, and that is going to build the statistics. That's so that you can actually go back and see where people stand. Is, is anybody getting close to their quota limit and why? And to do that, just quota check minus A. Rep quota will then report that data back to you. It will look something like that, tell you where people are. Uh, access control lists. Next. ACLs are very, very easy to set up in Solaris, um, unlike some distros. It's one of the things I like about it because you can change things around and only let people get to what they need to get to. Uh, you can, it will allow you to avoid the group account problems. Uh, to do that, you just use set up ACL to uh, set the access controls. For in our example here, what we're going to use is a file called access file. You, um, it will give you the output of what it currently looks like. And so you can see that I have the uh, ownership and the admins group can access the file. Do a uh, get FACL on it and it will show you the user has read write, group has read write, uh, other has nothing. If we want to change that to allow a user named Russ who was actually going to be sitting there showing you guys how to do this but he's gone now to have access to that file. He is not part of the admins group. Just uh, do a uh, set FACL minus M, the user and colon, and then whatever user you want to have access to the file. What access is going to have, in this case, read, write, um, and then the name of the file. Then when you do another get FACL on it, you will see that user Russ has been added to the list. Set UID and set GID files. Um, I would actually recommend that rather than do exactly what I say here, I would actually script this out because otherwise it will take you a long time. But you um, simply do a find on, on the uh, type here that will give you your set UID files. You can pipe that out to a file somewhere to, to look at later because like I mentioned before, there are a ton. Um, for the most part, they do not, the very, very few of them actually need to be set UID. Same thing with set GID. Um, once you have those piped out, you can go through them kind of at your leisure and look at them. Or if you uh, want to take the time to actually write a script out for it, you can have it grab through the file and pull out the ones that you want and change them, change the terms on them. Next, you want to find all the world writable files. Again, Solaris has quite a few of these. Simply do a find on them, pipe it out to a file, go through and look at them. You should be able at that point to um, go through and figure out which ones need to be and which ones don't because there aren't that many that do, especially in a server environment. Permissions. Root UMass. Um, set to either 027 or 077. To do that, you edit the Etsy default login file and just set the root UMass to 077, which is what I actually recommend. Uh, the way the UMass works is it XORs, every time you create a new file, it XORs with the root UMass that is set in that file, and it will then give you the opposite. So in our case, uh, every file that root creates is going to have a uh, initial permissions of 700. Uh, you also want to check the um, system device permissions. By default, Solaris default install, the default, default, yeah, device permissions are set correctly. You shouldn't change them. There, there's really no need. What you would want to do is uh, actually verify and dip and make sure that they don't change and they have not been changed. You can check that periodically. You also want to check the permissions on UT UTMP. Uh, ensure that they are set to 644. Ensure that Etsy password is set to 644. Um, gotta love the little LS graphic. And you want to make sure that Etsy shadow is set to 400. Also, 
So we need to restrict the uh, host.quiv, uh, our host, and .NET RC files. What I suggest doing on those is to actually touch and create them, and then chmod zero them, so that uh, when you look at them, they have no, no one has read, write, or uh, execute access to any of those. Restrict the uh, privileges on snoop to root only. Um, by default, I think that it sets it to, uh, yeah, pretty much everybody can use it. So uh, you don't want that. You don't want anybody who is on your network, especially if you're not in a switched environment, to be able to sniff all your network traffic. So uh, go ahead and set the uh, default per permissions to uh, execute for root and no one else. The root user path. User bin has been and user has been. Root user really does not need to have anything other than that in his path. That's done by editing the uh, dot, uh, dot profile file in the root, in root's home directory. Also, this is another one that you're probably going to want to script out a little bit, and I had actually planned to do that for you guys, but again, they had me pull a bunch of stuff off the CD, so you didn't get everything. Um, but you want to make sure that no user has a dot in his path. Just If you're going to do it manually, if you're in an environment where you don't have a lot of users, it's pretty easy. You can just echo each user's path and make sure that there are no dots in there. Um, yeah, alternatively, it can be scripted, thanks. Aliasing. Uh, I recommend that you alias both the ls and the rm command. Um, with ls, I like to add the dash a and dash b option, and with rm, I like to add the dash i. Uh, what that will do is, um, with ls, you will get all of your dot files uh, as it, without having to actually do a minus a. You will, every time you type ls out, you'll, you'll get all the hidden files immediately shown to you so you can keep track of them and you make sure that nothing has popped up that you aren't uh, aware of. Uh, with the dash i, what you get is, uh, it's going to ask you before you, uh, re I'm sorry, before it deletes the file, it will ask you, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, this is particularly important with root because root can delete very important files very quickly. Um, the example that I always like to give is a mistake that I made a long, long time ago where I did it, uh, rm minus rf uh, dot dot slash star and that is recursive and it started going up and up and up and up and up deleting files. I would have very much liked to have had that ask me before it did it, destroyed my entire file system. <coughs> uh, to do that, depending on the shell the root is using or the user is using, you um, follow the steps on there. You just uh, C shell, uh, use the alias command inside the .login file, born and corn, you uh, add those lines to .profile, and with bash, you use the .bash rc, and do the same, the same commands that you would use in the born and corn shell. Um, Include the system name in the root and admin shell prompt. Most of your admins have access to multiple boxes at a time. So there are SSH'd into four different machines running around making changes. What you want to do is make sure that for at least those people that the name of the system that they're on is in their prompt. That way they don't accidentally change things on the machine that they did not mean to. Again, you do that with the C shell and the .login file, born and corn in the .profile, and with bash and the .bash RC. And you just do, uh, for born and corn, the PS1 equals uh, uname minus n. For the uh, C shell, you set the prompt. Groups, accounts, and passwords. Um, what you want to do is require the users to use the new group command to change groups. To do that, don't have any users assigned to groups other than staff. Every, every single user to include your admins to have just a regular staff user group. 
Do you want to choose a strong group password for, uh, let's say we're going to have the admins group in this case. You want to choose an, a, a strong password for that group. Change the, the easiest way to, to actually set that password is to change the password on a normally locked account. I, I like to use LP. Um, to do that, just obviously password LP, put the password in, and then, oh, that's the slide that I lost. Um, then what you do is you actually uh, copy, cut and paste that out, edit the Etsy groups file, and um, replace the uh, no password in the Etsy groups file with that password. Then whenever someone wants to actually change to that group, they just issue a new group command, uh, new group admins, for instance. It will then prompt them for the password. They put the password in, and they uh, are then part of that admins group. If they do not have the correct password, they cannot change groups. Uh, obviously, also, you'll probably want to go back and relock the LP account when you're done. I like to restrict the use of SU. I'm kind of a jerk when it comes to getting root access. Um, I don't like. I like to make it as difficult as possible, even for people that are supposed to have it. Um, in, if you want to actually get UID zero on one of my machines, you're going to have to provide me with about eight strong passwords before you're done. Uh, one of those ways is by restricting the use of the uh, SU. There's our admins group. Um, assign a password to that group, which we talked about. Then anyone, then change your permissions on the group. Uh, and anyone who wants to, then SU, has to log in, has to new group first to the admins group, and then they will be allowed to SU. Lock the system accounts. Um, I, this one, I'm not quite sure why so many of these accounts are unlocked by default with Solaris. Um, make sure to lock dam uh, the daemon, the LP, the bin, the sys, the ADM, the UCP, blah, 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 lock them all so that they look like that. Um, also, lock the uh, sysadmin and sys groups in the Etsy group file. Same pr process. Next, you want to uh, edit the Etsy default password to uh, require a password change at least every eight weeks with a one-week interval between password changes. Uh, also, in that file, you can set your minimum character length for passwords. Uh, properly configured, you're going to look something like that where you have a max weeks of eight and then weeks of one and the uh, password length, eight, nine, ten, whatever you want to use there, at least eight for the password length. Um, one thing, if the password is already enabled, it is not going to do anything until they have to change. In other words, if you've got some guy who's got, you know, his username, it's three characters for his password as well, until eight weeks have passed and he has to uh, change his password, that password is still going to be sitting there. Run PW check to check for inconsistencies. Um, it, what that will do is it will check the uh, field number, the login name, the UID, the GID, and uh, the login directory and shell for the user. Uh, verify that those are correct. Do the same thing with the group. Run group check to make sure that those are properly configured and what you are expecting to see. Uh, then you're also going to want to verify that the permissions of Etsy Group are 644. Low all SU attempts. Um, I like to, some people have this set so that they're not all logged, that, the, that only the uh, failed SUs are logged. I like to log them all. I want to know everyone that tried and everyone that succeeded to get SU. Uh, disk space can be an issue if you don't check this and clear it out every once in a while. Um, first of all, to do that, you just verify that uh, Etsy default SU exists and provides a path to the SU log. It'll look something like that. Then um, you also want to log the failed login attempts to the login log. You have to actually create that file. It is not created by default. 
on a very large uh, network where you have a, a whole lot of users that are going to be logging in on a regular basis, this may not be feasible because you don't need to necessarily know every single login. It will just take up too much space and it, it's going to be something that you're never actually going to go through and look at anyway. <coughs> But if you're in a small environment where you have only a few users, um, it's a good idea to actually see when and where and how they log in. To do that, after you touch it, you um, change the ownership over to root and sys group, and you change the permissions to uh, root only. Um, failed, failed login attempts are going to look like this. Hacksaw did not get in. Um, what that tells us is the time that he attempted to log in and failed and um, where he tried to log in from. You want to uh, turn on INET D connection tracing and what that will do is attempt to trace all incoming TCP services and that will log in syslog. To do that you just edit the uh, init.d INET services file and add a minus T to the INET D start line. So it will look like that. Then you're going to want to kill and reboot the INET daemon because it is not currently running with tracing on. This is assuming, of course, a live system that's not going to be rebooted before you uh, put it on the network. Just kill it, restart it with the uh, minus T switch. You want to, this is one of those things I was talking about before where if you're in an operational environment, this is very, can be very dangerous. Um, you want to uh, configure the ETSI system to prevent stack-based buffer overflow attacks. Prevent is probably a little bit strong of a word there. Maybe help prevent is better. Um, to do that, you edit the ETSI system and set the noexec user stack to one and also the noexec user stack log to one. What that will do is um, any attempts to execute code on the program stack will be logged to syslog. Um, what I would do if you were in an operational environment is I would set the log to one and not actually set the uh, no exec user stack. I say that because especially with uh, some legacy uh, third party software, they are programmed to intentionally run uh, code on the stack. If you have, I believe Oracle 7 is actually one of those. So if you have Oracle 7 running uh, on your machine, it will uh, kill it and it will not work anymore. But if you log it for a couple of weeks or months, of normal environment time, then see if anything actually showed up in the log. If it did not, you're probably in good shape and you can go ahead and do this. If it did, then you know that you need to probably either upgrade that piece of software or if that's not going to happen, you don't want to do this. Next, you need to check your cron and add jobs for validity. Pretty much just look at them. Make sure that what you expected to be there is what is there. Um, place the user IDs of the um, users that are allowed to create cron jobs in the cron.allow file. Place the user IDs of the uh, people that are allowed to create add jobs in the uh, add.allow file. Uh, conversely, you want to make sure that people that are specifically not allowed are in the cron.deny. I say that because the cron.allow is your default. That is what it's going to use. However, if for some reason that is bypassing and fails, the cron.deny will, at least users that you know on the system that you absolutely do not want making, uh, creating cron and add jobs, it will fail over to there and if they are in there, they will, uh, you'll have a second, uh, secondary measure to make sure that they are not allowed to create the job. Um, it's also important to verify that cron jobs are legit both before and after adding a user to cron.deny. Um, that's because it only disallows users from creating future jobs. If they already have the job uh, scheduled with cron or at, it will continue to run. Uh, you can ensure you need to ensure that the uh, scripts and programs that are launched by cron and at are readable only by the owner. You don't want any, anybody and their brother to be able to take a look at these. Um, example of that is if mailrun.pl is scheduled to run in the cron tab, it should look like that. I'm the only person that has access to it. I'm the only person that can modify it. I'm the only person that can look at it. 
to the if you must uses. FTP, disable it. Use SFTP instead. If you have to use it, um, enable logging and debugging uh, by editing the inid.conf and adding the minus DL switches. With uh, properly logging, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Probably logging uh, entry in uh, inid.conf is going to look like that. Just at the end, you have the minus DL. You also want to make sure that at a minimum, root UUCP bin and anonymous are in the Etsy FTP users file. The Etsy FTP users file is the file that says who cannot use FTP, who cannot FTP into your system. At a minimum, those need to be in there. You want to configure the uh, Etsy default FTPD to remove the OS banner. Uh, you know, whenever you log into Solaris, they'll come back and they'll say SunOS 5. Whatever you want to uh, get rid of that. You don't want to give them any. Ex I mean, there's enough programs and tools out there that will tell them what operating system you're running. Don't just freely give them the information and cut half the time out of their work. Also, if they're actually having to use Nmap or whatever, you have enough. You're going to be getting something in your log somewhere along the line to let you know that you've been scanned, that you or whatever. Um, if they are able to just FTP to you and it tells them what, what, what version you're running, you've cut a lot of their work off. To do that, you just uh, echo um, banner with null. That's uh, open, close quotes into the Etsy default FTPD. That will, when they log in at that point, it will then have no uh, login banner. No OS banner, I should say. Telnet banner is uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, edit the Etsy issue to issue a warning banner, first of all. Uh, you're going to have to create that file. It is not created by default. And then just, again, put something in there. Unauthorized access. Uh, you're going to die if you come in. Whatever. I don't care. Just something that tells them, I don't want you here if you're not supposed to be here. If it, that, the only reason you're doing that, I mean, it's not like uh, Joe Leet guy is going to come in and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I have unauthorized, I'm not authorized access, I better log off. But what it will do is, if you have a properly uh, authorized by your legal department um, Etsy issue and a, a warning banner, when it t comes time for prosecution, you can take that to court and say, we told them don't come here, they came anyway, and we want them to pay. Um, configure the uh, default telnet D to remove the OS banner. That is the exact same process as the FTP banner, and it will uh, just get rid of the um, the OS version when somebody logs in. The NDDs. Um, are most of you guys familiar with the NDDs? I like to use them. They allow you to do quite a few things that uh, otherwise you don't really realize are running because nowhere does it say, oh, I have... Um, uh, IP uh, source routing enabled. There's no script that you can run through and find out where that is, but you can actually sit here with the NDDs and disable that stuff. Um, first thing I'd like to do is get rid of the uh, IP forwarding and directed broadcast. To do that, you just do an NDD-set slash dev slash IP, IP underscore forwarding, set it to zero and hit enter. Same thing for forward directed broadcast. Um, if you do a dash get instead of a dash set, it'll tell you what it is currently set to. You want to configure the system to ignore redirects and disable the forward source routing. Ignore redirects, you want to set to 1. Uh, forward source routing, you want to set to 0 to disable. You also want to configure the system to not respond to uh, address mass broadcast, echo broadcast, timestamp, and timestamp broadcast. Set all of those to zero with your NDDs. Uh, also, while I'm thinking about it, there are other, there's not just dev IP. You have uh, UDP, you have TCP specific. You can go through and, and look at them and see what exactly you do need, what exactly you don't need, and there is a lot that you can disable there, a lot of uh, enumeration info that will come back to haunt you later that you can stop right there at the OS level and not have to rely on your border devices. 
Alright, now here comes what I was talking about before about um, making it very, very difficult. Uh, a lot of people do not like to do this because it becomes very hard for your admins as well as everyone else to gain root access to the box. What I like to do is totally disable root login from everything. Root can never log in, period. The only way that you can get UID zero is to log in at this point. If we do this, they have to know the open boot banner to get the machine up. Then they have to have a regular user account and password so that they can log in. Next, if they want to ask you to root, they're going to have to have the admin's group password so they can get in. And finally, they're going to actually have to know the root password so they can ask you. If they can get through all that and own you, you deserve to be owned because you have crappy passwords. To do that, console only access. You have the, con the console setting and the Etsy default login to dev console. That way, root can't get in any other way. Can't SSH, can't Telnet, can't FTP, but it can still come in as a, norm, as a console user sitting at the box. Like I said, I like to go a step farther and disable it completely and just set it to dev null. TCP sequence prediction. Do uh, any of you guys use ISS? The ISS sucks with TCP sequence prediction. It shows up every time, no matter what, it, what version of what software you're running. Everything apparently has a TCP uh, predictable sequence. And that's because they set it to like, if it guesses one out of 500,000 correctly, then you, it's predictable. But um, you can actually, with Solaris 8, you can uh, take care of that problem, even for ISS's toughness. Um, to set the uh, TCP strong ISS to 2 in the uh, SC default by net and it, it is by default set to 1. Next, you want to uh, edit the Etsy profile and set the U limit to 0 to restrict the uh, generation of core files. Eh, it doesn't always work, but it's worth a try. Here's another one that can be kind of dangerous. Uh, randomizing the uh, file system inode numbers with the FSI RAN. Um, blah, blah, blah. Tells you why, but again, very dangerous. Uh, you have to um, unmount the, system, the file system before FSI RAN can be run. Um, and you want to make sure that you have backed them up before you do it and uh, you've checked the file system on them because the chances of it actually ruining your file system inodes are just as good as it working. So that's one that you're going to kind of take with a grain of salt. If it works and, you, and you've got a system in place where you could actually do it on a regular basis, it's great. If uh, you actually have a problem where you have an operational system that cannot go down for any length of time, I would actually skip this step. Tripwire and log check. Install and configure those to monitor for file system integrity. Um, install Snort. Any other intrusion detection that you, uh, IDS that you have uh, at your disposal. I like Snort. It's free. It works. Um, it's just what I prefer, if you want to use Real Secure or something else, go for it. You want, uh, but there are freeware IDS products out there that you can ha that you have access to, so you really don't have an excuse for not having some intrusion detection sitting on your servers. At the border, you are going to want to uh, stop all port 113, UDP port 113, and TCP port 113 traffic inbound. Also, you want to block ICMP type 17, that's your mask request, uh, traffic at the border. Uh, and finally, allow access to the file, through the firewall, only the necessary ports on specific machines. In other words, um, in other words, if you um, have a web server, a mail server, and a DNS server sitting behind your, your uh, firewall, what you want to do is allow port 25 traffic only inbound to the mail server, not port 25 traffic across the board. Same thing would go for HTTP, uh, port 80, and port 53. Specifically to that box, that way that if you for some reason skip a step, miss a step, or somebody accidentally re-enables a service on one of those machines, 
you have another layer of protection to keep you keep somebody from making access to your machine on that port. Um, implementing the stuff that we talked about here today is not going to make you uh, totally secure. We were talking about it the other day, and I've yet to find it actually totally 100% secure, you know it box. It cannot be made. If there is a determined attacker out there, and you are his target, and he is knowledgeable, he is probably going to get you. But what you can do by doing this is, sit, is take the time to reduce your script kitty threat to essentially nothing. You will also be able to, if you have an attacker that is looking for a um, target of convenience, you are not convenient. It's like the club. People, car thieves can get the club off of your car very quickly. However, when they walk by and they see two sitting next to each other, one has the club, one doesn't, they steal the car without. Unless it sucks. Finally, uh, also, patches. One of the biggest problems that I see, and I mentioned it before, is people not applying the patches. If you keep, if you maintain patch level, you will reduce the bulk of your problems. Just by maintaining patch level and disabling unneeded services, you've probably reduced your risk by about 90%. Um, I have a few references, on, references in here. Um, some of them are online, some of them are books. Soil Security by Peter H. Gregory. Uh, Sun Press actually puts that out. It is a very good book. A uh, lot of the, stuff, the info that came from this is, can be found in that book. Unfortunately, it is Solaris 7 specific. So that's why I uh, kind of like, I had to update quite a few of the things from this book. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do was show you. results of the ISS scans. Like I said, that is the initial scan with um, essentially a default install or dummy install. If you run through this process and do all the steps, when you are done, you will have not that. This. You have four rows remaining, trace route, ICMP net mask, ICMP timestamp, all of which should be blocked at your border, and open SSH running, which is more of an informational item to let you know that you have it. There is not a vulnerability actually associated with that, assuming that you have your open SSH in the current patch level. I had hoped uh, to actually get this presentation updated for Solaris 9. Unfortunately, I have a multiprocessor system, so I had to buy the software and I didn't get it in in time to update the slides. But I did get it in and get it installed. I ran through the process on Solaris 9 with actually better results because there is no open SSH. It comes bundled with SSH now. Um, however, I haven't tested everything to actually make sure that, every, that I'm not breaking anything. So before you do this on Solaris 9, you're going to want to do it in a non-operational environment and verify that none of the steps are going to break your system. I have time. That is it. I have time for about three questions because I have to go to the road driving contest right from here. So, um, yeah, if you want to come up, if, if people that want to ask questions, if you come up and use the mic so everybody can hear. Yeah, um, just have a question about the slides, if people don't have them. Uh, they will be posted on the DEF CON site eventually, but if you want them before that, you can go to www.securitytribe.com, and I will have a link off of there to the slides so that everybody can get a copy of them. Hi. Uh, Ruzi Venema used to have um, software that would help protect RPC services, like RPC buying and stuff. I don't know if they still work for Solaris 8 or are there any other. You could also use it in combination with TCP wrappers to help wrapperize and protect your RPC services. Is anything recommended for Solaris 8 or 9 in, the, in that manner? Unfortunately, I don't really have a very good answer for you. I don't know. <laughs> Explain your pros and cons of using sudo instead of su. Actually, uh, sudo I have absolutely no problem with. Um, it essentially is doing the same thing that I'm doing with uh, the lockdown with the groups. And thank you very much because I meant to mention that. It is, it is, if 
you want to make it a little bit easier on your admins, that is a, uh, a definite way to do it. And there, I don't see any problem with doing it that way. If there are no other questions, I would just like to say thank you. And uh, one, actually, I have a couple of questions for you guys. And those who have left have missed out. I've got two boxes. I'm going to ask a couple of questions from you. And uh, are you guys going to ask them? Are you guys going to ask the questions for the giveaways? No, we're the next one. Excellent. I'm getting out of your way. Um.